Suppose that you're driving 20 miles across town to meet up with your friends. Your expected average travel speed is 20 miles per hour, and therefore, the expected travel time should be one hour, right? What if I were to tell you that the correct answer was actually seven over six? Today, I want to demonstrate to you why that may be the case based on a really neat and valuable mathematical concept. Not the law of averages, but rather the flaw of averages. The basic idea is that feeding average values into a function or model will typically not lead to the model's average output or response. Simply put, average in does not lead to average out. Now, why is that the case? We'll delve into just that for the remainder of this video. So let's get started. To start things off, let's try to define what we actually mean by the mean or expected value of something random by looking at the situation of rolling a die. We have six possible outcomes denoted with a lowercase x, each with a probability p of one over six. To be as clear as possible, we refer to something random, say rolling a die, with a capital letter, while each possible outcome will be written in lower case. Now the technical definition of the mean or expected value for a random variable can be expressed with the following equation. Here we are computing an average based on each possible outcome, x sub i, that the die can take on, weighted according to each outcome's probability of occurrence. Plugging in our values into our formula, we arrive at 3.5, reflecting the central tendency of our random variable. As long as you can remember this definition of the mean or expected value for any random variable, you should be all set for the remainder of this video. Computing the expected value for rolling a die is not the most exciting thing in the world, so let's spice things up a bit. For each viewer of this video, I'm going to roll this die and pay you some amount of money based on whichever number pops up. In a situation like this one, you're probably not too interested in the die roll itself, but rather how its possible outcomes and probabilities map to some form of payment to you. This is what we typically find in the real world. We are really interested in how an outcome of some random input, say x, maps to some resulting output, which we'll refer to as f of x, and in the next section, I'll simply denote this as z. Let's suppose that there are two possible models I'm considering in terms of how it will pay you based on the outcome of rolling this die. The first is four times whatever number pops up plus one, and the other is whatever number pops up squared. In both cases, you are making money. Not the best financial decision on my end. For each of these models, let's now try to compute the expected payment z associated with rolling the die. Let's first plot each of our functions and now add six blue circles representing each possible outcome that the die can take on. I'm going to make each of these circles the same size as each possible value for x has the same probability of occurrence. We can now map each of these possible outcomes to z and develop the following probability distributions. With these distributions, we can compute the expected value of z, which is again a weighted average of each possible outcome weighted according to its probability of occurrence. In this case, although our two distributions look quite different, the central tendency for both of them hovers around 15, which is a very important point. It is very possible for two very different looking distributions to have the same expected value. Now, keep in mind that for both of these situations, the expected payout is $15. How does that compare to the result you would get if you simply plugged in our expected input value of 3.5 into our two equations? In the first case, 4 times 3.5 plus 1 equals 15, or put another way, the expected value of our output is exactly the same as plugging in the expected value of our input into our function. Average in yields average out. In the second situation though, 3.5 squared is approximately 12. The expected value of our output is actually greater than the result we would have observed by plugging in our input's expected value into our model. Average in does not yield average out. Now, I anticipated that this would happen because of Jensen's inequality, which shows up quite a bit in data science. So let's talk about Jensen's inequality, and through a neat visual and mathematical proof, demonstrate and prove why average in typically does not lead to average out. Let's first define a convex function, and there are a couple ways to visualize one. The first is if I draw a line between any two arbitrary points along my function, and if that line is always above or on my function between those two points, then I have a convex function. Alternatively, let's draw a tangent line for our function. Notice that, as I compute my tangent line for different points, my original function always lies above it. If that happens, you are again dealing with a convex function. So now that we have a sense of what a convex function is, let's redraw our second model from earlier, where my payment to you follows whatever number shows up when I roll the die squared. Let's now focus our attention on a certain point along this function, 
the expected value of our die roll, and the corresponding payout value. We can now draw our tangent line to this point and note that all values of our original function, f of x, are greater than or equal to this tangent line, which I'll refer to as h of x. Let's now add to our plot our six possible outcomes when we roll our die, each with a 1 in 6 probability of occurrence, and if we map these possible outcomes to f of x, we can see that those numerical values are higher than if we were to map those same outcomes to h of x. In other words, the expected value of f of x is greater than the expected value of h of x. Now what is the expected value of h of x, and how does this tie to the flaw of averages? Let's first write out our equation for h of x. At our tangency point, which is represented by our white circle, h of x equals the function of our input's expected value. And to move along our tangent line, our white circle either increases or decreases according to the slope of this line, b, scaled by the amount x deviates from the expected value of x, leading to the following equation. Having defined h of x, let's now compute its expected value by weighing each possible outcome according to its probability of occurrence. We can equivalently expand this formula into three terms and, for each constant, move them outside of our summation operators. This looks messier, so why would I do this? Well, we know that the summation of all probabilities for all outcomes should equal 1, so those two summation operators can disappear. And we know that the summation for our last term looks exactly like what we saw at the start of this video. It is the expected value of x. And because our second and third terms now offset each other, we can now simplify our equation such that the expected value of h of x is equal to the function of our expected input value. And therefore, the expected value of our model output, f of x, is greater than or equal to the function of our expected input value. And this principle applies to any convex function. This is Jensen's inequality. Now I think that that's pretty neat. And the opposite applies as well if our function is what we call concave meaning that, for any point, our tangent line lies above our function. As you can see, if we map our six possible outcomes to our tangent line, those six values are larger than those associated with those for our original function. And so, the expected value of f of x is now less than or equal to the expected value of h of x. And because the expected value of h of x is equal to the function of the expected value of x, we now know that our expected function output is now less than or equal to the function of our expected model input. So in summary, when we deal with linear systems, the flaw of averages does not exist. Using an average input and feeding it into our model or function will yield an average output. However, in most situations, our models or systems are non-linear. If our function is convex, our expected model output should be greater than what we observe if we feed our expected input value into our model. And conversely, if our function is concave, our expected model output will generally be less than what we observe if we feed our expected input value in our model. And if you can remember this, you'll have a pretty good sense of whether your modeling application is subject to the flaw of averages. Now with this in mind, let's go back to our original problem. If we hop in our car, the total distance that we will drive is equivalent to our average travel velocity multiplied by the time we spend driving. And therefore, the total time required to go from point A to point B is equal to the ratio of our distance to velocity. At the start of this video, I noted that the total distance was 20 miles, so let's plug that into D, and now let's plot the relationship between travel time and velocity. And I can see here that if I draw a tangent line to this function, that tangent line will be below it. This means that the expected travel time f of e is greater than or equal to the travel time associated with plugging in our expected average velocity into this relationship. Now let's assume that our travel speed is uncertain, and that is due to uncertainty in traffic conditions. Based on our own judgment, there is a 25% chance that your average travel speed will be 10 or 30 miles per hour, and there is a 50% chance that your average travel speed will be 20 miles per hour. I can therefore compute the expected average travel speed as we've done multiple times in this video, and I can then feed that value into my relationship between travel time and velocity. Doing so, we arrive at one hour. If I'm going to travel 20 miles at a speed of 20 miles per hour, then unsurprisingly, I should arrive at my destination in one hour. However, let's now plot our three possible average travel speeds, and I'm going to make the blue circle associated with 20 miles per hour twice as large as the others to reflect the fact it has two times the probability of occurring. We can now map those three possible outcomes to our model, 
and compute the expected value of t, and if we do that, we arrive at 7 over 6. And here we see the flaw of averages in action, and we're seeing it occur for a fairly simple system or application. And hopefully you now understand that average in may not lead to average out. Fortunately for us though, we have the tools available to us such as Monte Carlo simulation to explicitly model our uncertainties and analyze and solve realistic problems. Thanks as always for sticking around. If you haven't done so already, think about subscribing to the channel. It is easy to do and goes a long way in supporting this work. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.